I'd love to start tonight by welcoming everyone to this week's Citizens Climate University. It's a weekly webinar program of Citizens Climate Lobby that provides CCL supporters like you and I with access to in-depth training opportunities on topics related to climate change and effective climate advocacy. I'm your host, Brett Cease, and tonight's topic is specifically on understanding methane fees. What we're going to do tonight is join CCL Research Coordinator Rick Knight for a training that's going to explore the various ways that a methane fee is part of the Build Back Better Act or whatever might pass as climate policy this spring would be designed and implemented. Let's get to know a little bit more about our speaker before I pass it to him to take it from here. And a little about Rick. Rick Knight is a research coordinator with Citizens Climate Lobby. His work mission is to work with Vice President of Legislation and Research, Danny Richter, on independent experts to strengthen CCL's science, technology, and policy fundamentals. His portfolio includes updating and maintaining our laser talks. If you're a big fan of those, I'll put a link to those in the chat. And we also have a whole host of white papers and analytical projects that keep Rick busy. Prior to joining the CCE team, Rick completed a 40-year career in energy and pollution control technology research at Gas Technology Institute, retiring in 2016 as an institute engineer. Rick was one of the first members in the Chicago area for CCL back in 2011, founded the Chicago Southwest chapter, and served as state coordinator from 2015 to 2018. But if we've done our job well tonight, uh, we have the following threefold learning goals to engage all of us really walking away and becoming better advocates with. We wanna have a chance to understand what methane is, where it comes from, and how it affects climate change or our larger climate system overall. We want to think through and understand what measures are being enacted or proposed to control this gas. And we wanna think through and understand how it fits within CCL's overall strategy for climate advocacy. So thanks so much for being here, everyone. And the floor is yours, Rick. Uh, okay, so we're gonna start by talking about methane in the news. Uh, I'm going to then talk about what methane is and why we should care about it. Where does it come from? What are the policies and regulations and so on that are in place or being proposed to deal with it? And how does it fit into our advocacy? So methane in the news, is it really the hot new thing? Uh, you might think so from uh, seeing <clears throat> articles like this in Nature. It says, control methane to slow global warming fast. Cutting methane gas uh, is crucial for the climate fight out of BBC News. It makes it look like this is a new discovery. Uh, and PBS NewsHour says the new global methane pledge can buy time while the world drastically reduces fossil fuel use. Buying time sounds good. And here from Vox, it's time to freak out about methane emissions. So what is methane and why should we care about it? Well, what it is, Technically, it's a hydrocarbon gas with one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. And it would look something like this if you had a really good microscope and you could see what it looks like floating up in the atmosphere there. But the next question, what makes it a greenhouse gas? Well, when infrared radiation from the Earth hits it, and that infrared radiation is how the Earth controls its temperature by sending infrared radiation out to space. But if it should hit one of these methane molecules, that molecule will vibrate, storing that energy for a fraction of a second. And then it can release it again as infrared radiation in a random direction. Now it can go up to space where it continues going where it was going in the first place, or it could go back down to the earth, creating some warming. Now this is the secret of greenhouse gases. Uh, what these gases do is they intercept some of that infrared radiation, taking heat away from the Earth, and then re-radiate it in a random direction. Now, I showed it going straight up and straight down, but it could actually go in any direction. Half the time, it's going to go back down to the Earth. So that's how it retains heat in the Earth's atmosphere, by sending that radiation back down to Earth. And as you, as you probably know, there are other greenhouse gases, mainly carbon dioxide, uh, in addition to methane, uh, nitrous oxide, and water vapor as well. So these all work together. And methane is what we're really concerned about today. So now, does methane stay around forever? Once it's emitted into the air, how long does it last? Well, it doesn't last forever. It actually reacts with oxygen in the atmosphere, breaking down into carbon dioxide and water. 
about half of it decomposes over a, about a nine year period, another half in the following nine years. This is called the half life in the atmosphere of this particular chemical. Um, and so it declines over time. Now it's the same kind of process that happens um, when, you, when you light your stove or your furnace that uses natural gas, only in that case, it happens very rapidly when it's ignited. It also happens in the atmosphere, but much more slowly, but it does happen. So this chart shows the percent remaining after a, say a spike of methane enters the atmosphere over a hundred year period. So you start out, it, it actually has a global warming potential of around 120 times that of, of CO2. It's much more potent than CO2, but it, it quickly goes down. And uh, so that after about nine years, you're right around 50%. So that's what this half-life means. And uh, you may have heard about um, the global warming potential number being much more powerful than CO2. And these numbers also depend on the time frame that you're talking about. So for example, over a hundred year period, as the IPCC reports, CO, uh, methane has an equivalent CO2 global warming potential of about uh, 36 times, 32 to 30, <clears throat> sorry, 36 times. Well, in case you're, you've wondered what the heck does that number mean? That's what it means. It means that if you look at that total time period and just take the amount of warming that's come from this declining gas, it's equivalent to about 36 times CO2. Over a 20 year period, that number is more like about 85 to 87 uh, times CO2. So wanted to make you understand what those numbers mean. And um, just as I was saying, over 20 years, it's about 87 times. That's the latest estimate from uh, the consensus of research. And over 100 years, 32 times stronger than, uh, than CO2. It does break down into CO2, but of course, CO2 is much, much less potent. So every, every ton of methane that originally enters the atmosphere, which is originally about 120 times as potent as CO2, by the time 100 years have passed, it's, it's no longer, it's, it's just CO2 and water. So this, this number 32 times stronger really means the, con, the, um, the composite amount of warming that's taken place over all those years. But after that 100 year period, there's no more methane, it's, it's just CO2. So it's, since the CO2 uh, has a concentration of over 400 parts per million, methane really has a much lower concentration. So the amount of CO2 it produces is kind of insignificant compared to the carbon dioxide that we emit from fossil fuels. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Okay, so how much methane is out there in the first place? Well, looking at the concentration of these gases in parts per million, you can see CO2 is about 411, I believe, annual average right now. Methane is just a little bit under two parts per million. And nitrous oxide, another powerful greenhouse gas, only 0.3. So it looks like those are not very important, but this, this chart doesn't have an adjustment for the potency, the global warming potential or GWP as it's called. And the reason this graph only goes back to 1984, because that's when we started measuring methane in the atmosphere. So now if you look at what they would look like when you apply those global warming potential factors, it looks a little bit different. Uh, you can see that the methane is quite a bit more significant, as is the nitrous oxide. So in terms of warming of what's in the atmosphere right now, and this is using that 20-year near-term GWP, uh, CO2 accounts for 61%, methane for 24%, nitrous oxide for 15%. And there are a few other minor greenhouse gases. But let's move on from there. Now, if you just isolate on the methane in the atmosphere, just pull out those other gases and look at how it's developed since 1984, you can see some interesting things. It was rising uh, pretty steadily until about the middle 90s, around 2000, it was almost flattening out. 
Then for some reason, it started rising very quickly. Why did that happen? Uh, we don't really know yet, but we have some clues. And if, to get to explaining those clues, we should look at where does it come from? So where does it come from? Is it natural? Is it human cause? Is it a combination? And we're going to explore that. Now, I've uh, put some of the top sources in alphabetical order here. Okay, animals, which include both livestock, wild animals, and in some countries, things like termites, biomass fires, which would include wildfires, but also a uh, much larger scale uh, intentional burning of forests to make, make room for farms and, and ranches, mostly outside of the United States. It's really not done in the United States or in North America. Uh, methane from coal mining you know, that, that comes out when the ground is opened up and the coal is removed. Landfills, of course, need no explanation. You know what those are? Oil and gas um, and blocking part of my slide, rice farming, rice paddies, actually, because of the way they're, they're operated, uh, a fair amount of methane comes out of that. Wastewater and other kind of waste facilities. And then finally, wetlands and other natural uh, ecosystems. So we're going to run another poll here, as uh, Brett has put up here. How would you rank these global methane sources from most important to least important to address? Remember, I've put them in alphabetical order, so you should not be biased by the order you see them in their screen on the screen. Yeah, okay, so here's what really the, the answers really are. Wetlands are the biggest source of methane. Now, we're not just talking about human caused sources, we're talking about human and natural. So wetlands account for about 30%. Animals, including, as I said, livestock and wild animals, uh, about 18%. Biomass burning, about 12%. Landfills, about 9%. Oil and gas, actually only about 8%. And rice farming, a little bit lower, uh, just under 8%. Wastewater, 7 And coal mines, 6%. So the two sources of fossil fuels add up to about 14%, about a little bit more than the biomass burning. So that may surprise you. And uh, it just goes to show you that uh, things are not always what you, what you expect. Uh, this is not to uh, speak on behalf of fossil fuels or anything like that, but it's, it's, it's just important to know where is it coming from because we need to be able to design policies that are really going to tackle the problem. Uh, you know, in, in terms of natural sources like wetlands, it also could be an issue that climate change itself is increasing methane emissions from natural sources. That's something that uh, research is showing. Now, another thing I wanna address is how do we know these things? Um, there is research based on isotopes, uh, carbon isotopes and other chemical fingerprints of methane in the atmosphere that have been analyzed to show what the sources are. Uh, and it is showing that recent increases have been mainly from biological sources because methane that's uh, coming from underground has a different isotope signature. So there's some robust research to support these uh, results. Okay, let me move on from there. Now let's talk about where geographically global methane emissions come from. There is something called the Global Methane Initiative uh, around the world, which uh, countries, uh, companies, banks, and NGOs have joined to try to tighten up our ability to track where methane is coming from and what to do about it, to share strategies to address it. So there are 44 countries so far that have joined the Global Methane Initiative and those countries represent 81% of global GDP. So as you can see, major industrial nations like the US, Canada, Brazil, uh, and not only developed nations, but less developed nations like China and India that uh, have a lot of fossil fuel emissions, Australia, Russia, several uh, European countries. So that's why th this really represents a large part of the industrial world. So let's take a look at what the Global Methane Initiative 
oh yeah, just one more note, the non-GMI segment includes the remaining non-natural methane sources. So let's look at a chart that the Global Methane Initiative has uh, created from their data showing where the emissions have been coming from, going back to 1990. So this is uh, million metric tons of CO2 equivalent emissions worldwide. <clears throat> As you can see, coal, oil, and gas are in the range of uh, about uh, 15, 20%, maybe 25% each. Agriculture and waste, this does not include uh, non-natural sources like uh, wetlands. So the GMI countries account for a little over half of methane emissions. The non-GMI segment includes the remaining non-natural sources. So given the amount of industrialization that's represented by these global methane initiative countries, what's the source of all this non-GMI methane? And as I've mentioned already, the uh, research seems to be indicating that it's mainly from biological sources like livestock, farming, burning of, uh, of forests to make room for, for agric agriculture, that sort of thing. Uh, and so this kind of confirms that. Now, let's look at another chart to see how these different sources have changed over the years, because it's a little bit hard to tell from that that uh, area chart. So one more chart. Actually, I lied. There's one more after this. So here's the change in the methane emissions, methane only, since 1990, attributed to coal mining. So as you can see, it was, it was fairly flat, and then it really started taking off around 2005. But for some reason, around 2015, it sort of flattened out. And I'll get into what the possible reasons for that are. Let's look at oil and gas. Similarly, it was really spiking in the early 2000s, but then around 2007 or 8, they kind of flattened out. So even though fossil fuel usage has been going up dramatically without pause, as you can see from CO2 emissions, methane emissions have been um, brought more under control. They're certainly not going down, but not going up. Um, worldwide. And we think the reasons for that may have to do with the fact that as, uh, as the technologies spread around the world, uh, equipment upgrades and new technologies are applied that are better controlled. And also regulations in many of these industrialized countries, particularly in Europe, have been uh, tightened up over time. So uh, that's something just to take into account. Now, if you look at agriculture and waste, that, on the other hand, was relatively flat until recently, and now it's starting to go up uh, pretty steadily. And finally, the non-GMI countries. This, as you can see, just kind of overwhelms everything else in terms of where the direction is headed right now for methane. So as the chart shows, most emissions growth in methane has been in the non-GMI countries and in non-fossil sources. Uh, primarily um, agriculture and, and livestock and so on. So how do U.S. methane emissions compare with the rest of the world? Since we're talking about U.S. policy, I don't know if we have any Canadians here, but uh, I would apologize to them that I'm, I'm just talking about the U.S. right now, but uh, a lot of the same issues apply to Canada as well, because they have a very robust oil and gas industry. So looking at per capita emissions, on a per capita basis, you might be surprised that worldwide and U.S. methane emissions are not that different overall. The kilograms of methane per person is in the range of 90 to 95 kilograms per year. But as you can see, <clears throat> where these emissions come from are quite different. In the U.S., fossil fuels account for about a third of the emissions, whereas only about half that much from the world overall. Farming and livestock, a little bit more in the US, but not that terribly different. Now, this includes also natural sources of methane. And wetlands, as you can see, by far make up the difference between the world and US in terms of per capita methane emissions.
uh, landfills and waste are much smaller outside the US. And there's some other sources like um, oceans and permafrost and geological sources that we don't have any data for the US. So that may add a little more on this end of the, of the bar. But it does show you that um, the real crux of the problem worldwide is in these, these areas. Okay, so what have we learned so far? Methane is a potent greenhouse gas. It does decompose quickly in the atmosphere. Methane already in the atmosphere accounts for almost a quarter of near-term warming, if you look at that 20-year uh, time window. Now, about 14% of global methane emissions are from fossil fuels, and about the remainder, 86%, are from biological sources. Worldwide, fossil methane contributes about 4% of greenhouse gases, but about 9% in the U.S. of total greenhouse gases, not just methane, but methane and all the others. So that gives you a perspective on where we should really be focusing our, ex our, our efforts and our resources. And now finally, to get to the policy perspective, since this talk is supposed to be about methane fees, I thought eventually I should get out of the, the nerdy stuff and get into the wonky stuff. So what are current US methane policies? We do have some regulations uh, that are promulgated by the EPA and also by the Bureau of Land Management, as you can see here. First of all, I don't know uh, if anybody has heard about the Quad O rules. This is uh, a set of rules that were put in place under the Obama administration. Actually, they go back uh, further than that in the Clean Air Act to control volatile organic emissions from oil and gas facilities. And for those of you who like to uh, keep track of which part of the, the Code of Federal Regulations is being talked about. It's 40 CFR 60, subpart 0000, and thus the quad O designation. Now, uh, under the Obama administration, those rules were expanded to include methane as a greenhouse gas, and that was called the quad O A rules. There's another term uh, that I, I wanted to make you aware of. LDAR means leak detection and repair. And it's just what it sounds like. It's methodologies for finding methane leaks and fixing them, basically fixing the plumbing. And that's an important part of these quad OA rules. Uh, there are monitoring rules also, very strict, uh, very um, detailed rules on how to monitor methane leakage applied to the oil and gas industry. There are different rules for new sources versus existing sources. In other words, if you drill a new well, you have to comply with different rules than if you've already got a well that's operating. There are state level regulations that uh, should be considered as part of this regulatory landscape. So I just wanted to make you all aware of uh, kind of where things are right now. Okay, here's a timeline of US methane rulemaking. So back in, in, in May of 2016, the Obama administration put these quad OA rules into, into effect in order to uh, force, uh, <coughs> compel the gas, oil and gas industry to take certain steps to repair leaks. That actually had been originally proposed in 2014. So it gives you an idea how long it takes between a, a, a regulation first being proposed and actually going into effect. That same year in, in August, at the end of August, some landfill regulations were put into place under the EPA of, about methane leakage. And later in that same year in November, the Bureau of Land Management put some restrictions on natural gas venting and flaring. So a pretty robust set of regulations, at least on that industry, to cut down on methane leakage. And I would acknowledge that there are a lot of reasons to, uh, to limit and reduce leakage from the oil and gas facilities other than climate change, because uh, as many of you may be aware, 
there are a lot of health impacts, potential health impacts with the in, in air quality around those facilities, uh, groundwater contamination, uh, which need to be brought under control. And so <clears throat> even if we might uh, take one perspective on methane leakage in terms of climate impact, the, um, the other issues are very important, especially for, for communities that are near those facilities. Anyway, moving on in the timeline, you may be aware that a fellow named President Trump took office in January of 2017. Uh, in April of that year, the new EPA administrator, Scott Pruitt, and began to enact a process to stop the Quad OA program. In July of that year, a DC court denied that delay. And so the EPA was not able to put that, uh, put a hold on those regulations. They still had to be put into effect. They were successful under the Trump administration. At this point, this was uh, the new EPA administrator, Andrew Wheeler. They were successful in getting those Bureau of Land Management rules lifted. So they rescinded the oil and gas sector rules on uh, venting and flaring. And in August of 2020, the Trump EPA was finally successful in rescinding the regulations on oil and gas. Then we had an election and President Biden took office a few months later. And shortly after that, the Quad OA rules were restored. The Trump EPA reversal was lifted. And one more thing that occurred in last November, a new set of rules, the Quad OB and OC rules were proposed to tighten up on those regulations further. So what do we learn from all this? This is a good illustration of how fraught it is to depend on executive branch regulations to tackle climate change. Because here, four years went by and rules that took effect in 2016 are now taking effect again in 2021 and uh, being strengthened going into 2022. So that's really highlights the importance of legislation. I'm gonna quickly talk about where those leaks are. This is a, a kind of a, a good a graphic that shows in the natural gas supply chain where the leaks are. And they're primarily in the gas field operations. Things like valves, compressors, uh, not mainly from the wells themselves, but from equipment, uh, tanks that they use to store the water that comes up with the, with the gas, and then they vent those tanks or send them to a flare. So that's where a lot of the emissions are. And the transmission uh, pipelines, there's also a lot of equipment that leaks. And this is where we get into this LDAR rulemaking, where the EPA can uh, compel businesses to use different types of equipment to re restrict those leaks, uh, more frequent maintenance, uh, different procedures. So there is a, an agreement between the US also in Canada to, re to uh, reduce methane emissions by 45%, I think by 2025, not sure of the year. And so this is the way that they've been trying to do this. So these rules are in place and they should be effective. Now, uh, as far as other methods of dealing with methane leakage through the legislative branch, how is methane leakage treated in current carbon pricing bills? Well, and Ted Deutsch's HR 2307, our very favorite Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act, methane coverage is implied, but must strike a balance between emissions and administrative burden. And what this means is basically that the, uh, the rule makers get to take into account how much methane, how much greenhouse gas reduction you're gonna get using a certain amount of, uh, of carbon fee application to those leaks. Uh, and uh, to reduce the administrative burden, not only on companies, but on, but on the government itself. Are they better off putting those energies and those efforts and that personnel and those financial resources into other measures? 
So it's, it's kind of a, an open question if the uh, EICDA were to be enacted, how it would be covered. Under the America Clean Future Fund Act by uh, Senator Durbin and uh, Representative Newman, methane is covered. Fugitive emissions are specifically identified. Covered entities include US well operators. So a much more aggressive way of applying the carbon fee to methane. Under Brian Fitzpatrick's Market Choice Act, that's the one who that, that um, takes all the revenue and, and puts it into uh, offsetting gasoline taxes, but it, it's another carbon fee. Methane emissions are covered downstream of gas processing plants and from industrial facilities. So there are some specific uh, provisions for putting the fee on methane emissions. And finally, Sheldon Whitehouse has a bill called the Save Our Future Act, which is the most aggressive at all. It has an entire separate detailed section devoted to putting a fee on fugitive methane emissions. They'll bear a supplemental fee. So that's a little bit more like a methane fee separate from the carbon fee. And so there is separate methane fee legislation and what we would call dedicated methane fee bills that they're not talking about a carbon fee like EICDA, but just a fee on methane, on leaked methane. So Ted Deutsch and Sheldon Whitehouse have both introduced this bill called the Methane Emissions Reduction Act, in which oil and gas supply chain firms have to pay $1,800 a ton on fugitive emissions that exceed a small percentage of their gas sales. They have the option to either measure their emissions and report those measurements using approved methods to the EPA, or to use a basin average number. Now, what a basin is, it's kind of a region uh, where oil and gas extraction takes place in a certain kind of geological uh, formation. So there are, out, I think, about eight or 10 of these basins around the United States. So <clears throat> those companies could say, we're not going to put our money into measuring our emissions. We'll just take the average for this area. So that's been proposed in a separate bill called the Methane Emissions Reduction Act. But finally, in the Build Back Better Act, as many of you may be aware, there has been a methane fee. Uh, John Yarmouth was the titular sponsor of this bill, uh, but it, it's just part of the Build Back Better package. It's called Section 30114, the EPA methane fee. Under this stipulation, oil and gas supply chain firms would pay a little bit lower price, $1,500 a ton. And I should note that this, this 1800 is about equivalent to a $20 per ton carbon fee. And then you multiply that by that um, global warming potential of methane. So it's, it's essentially the same as if you had a $20 a ton a carbon fee. And this is closer to like $17, $18 a ton of a carbon fee. So that's applied on fugitive emissions exceeding a small percentage of sales varying by the type of operation, whether it's a well operator or a, a processing plant operator, they have different standards. Measurement is not specifically addressed as it is in, in the Methane Emissions Reduction Act. So that's kind of left up, uh, left open to rulemaking. But this is the bill that passed the House back in last November. And the same provisions are sitting in the Senate Finance Committee uh, being hotly debated, as you've probably read in the news, uh, with um, one particular senator being, uh, I'm not going to name him or her, <laughs> uh, being skeptical of a methane fee, but not having ruled it out, as well as not having ruled it out a carbon fee. Build back better analysis that was done by the Rhodium Group with input also from Princeton University Zero Lab. Uh, let's look for some context on what they thought a methane fee in the Build Back Better plan would achieve. The required cuts in CO2 equivalent emissions, all kinds of greenhouse emissions, uh, amount to about 1,900 million metric tons. So about 28% of 2021 current emissions in all greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, and others. 
that's what's required to meet our U.S. commitment to get to 50% below 2005 emissions by 2030. The methane fee, according to Princeton Zero Lab, would cut about 150 million metric tons, or about 3% of those 2021 emissions. So a nice little bit to get you a little bit further than where you would have been without it, but it's, it's only about 10% of the total that we need to cut from current emissions. So I'll stop there and uh, talk about some conclusions. Methane is a potent but short-lived greenhouse gas. Most, most methane comes from natural and agricultural sources, but a, a fair amount still from oil and gas and, and coal mines. Reducing fossil methane emissions is important for health and environmental justice, but it has far less climate impact than CO2. So the message here is we've got to keep our eye on the ball. So while CCL <clears throat> should and will continue to support measures to cut methane emissions for a lot of reasons, we have to maintain our focus on the big picture, which is 50% by 2030, 50% below 2005 emissions by 2030, and with that, thank you so much, Rick. Obviously, that was quite the in-depth presentation. Well, at this point, I know we've got a robust discussion. I know we also want to continue to emphasize the importance of supporting whatever is in the ambitious climate policy that hopefully will emerge from the Senate here in the weeks to come. So um, we're going to have to close at that uh, just because we are at the top of the hour. But if you want to follow up, the slides for anyone's reference later on are available at cclusa.org forward slash methane fee slides with a little dash in between those three words. And you're also more than welcome to ask any ongoing questions. I'll make sure to uh, stick Rick in the forums uh, that are related to this follow-up, okay. our cclusa.org forward slash forums in community. So I'm going to unmute all lines. I'm so glad to see everyone here. We look forward to hearing your ongoing feedback. Keep up the great work out there. And let's give a big round of applause for Rick, everyone. Thanks again for being here, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, Rick. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.